Welcome to December's Tech of the Month, where we discuss all the latest news and reviews. This month, we have got the widest disc wheel available, but we're going to ask the question, how much wider are road wheels going to go? We've also got the brand new Tax Neo Plus Smart Bike, which we're going to put head to head against the recently released Wahoo Kicker Bike. Behind me, you can see this rather tasty looking Canada, which is our bike of the month. And of course, we've got our Garmin giveaway. First up, before we get into our main topic of conversation, Silka has been up to some very Silka things, and they have just released a new wax, which comes in at a pretty impressive price. For the 300 gram tub, it's going to cost $165 or 199 euros. It is incredibly expensive and it makes it one of the most expensive lubes on the market. Feels like Silk has been churning the lubes out at the moment. It's yeah, not so long since the last release, so how does this one really differ? Yeah, so for that price tag, you'd hope that it would be incredibly fast. However, the claim from Silka is, is that it's half a watt faster compared to its own secret chain blend, which isn't that much, especially when you consider the price of the secret chain blend, which is about $40 um, or 48 euros. I mean, it's massively cheaper, but the more expensive one is only half a watt quicker. So it's, yeah, it's hard to work out why they've made it. I mean, one of the other benefits that Silka have claimed is that it is going to last twice as long as other wax lubricants on the market. However, my question then is that if it does last the kind of claimed 800 kilometers before recoating, are you still gonna be enjoying that half watt benefit of efficiency? And I've, I've got to assume that it's only gonna be in dry conditions um, that you're gonna be enjoying those speed benefits. Yeah, wax really doesn't stay on that well, in, or some waxes don't stay on too well in rain. Correct. What will they say about that? Well, they have said that, I mean, despite what we think about it only really working in dry weather, Silka do say that they've made it to be more versatile in the wet and that it should last in the wet as well. Um, but I think that's only something you're going to be able to test when we can when we can get our hands on it, really. Do you think they'll give us some? Uh, I hope so. I hope they don't charge us because I don't, I don't, I don't want to pay that much. I, wax. I can't afford that. Yeah, so how they achieve this half a watt saving? Well, so they've continued their research um, into graphene. Um, however, there is this new fancy material called nanine, which is a derivative of graphene, which was actually developed at the University of Manchester. And they say that it is an ultra high quality few layer graphene produced using a patented manufacturing process. So. I think that's probably kind of justifying why that price is so high um, to some extent. Um, but yeah, that's, that is the key ingredient that is making this a fast wax. The other thing that Silka have claimed is that it is possible to prolong the life of your chain. Um, and the numbers that they're quoting are around 30,000 kilometers or 18 and a half thousand miles. But that is gonna be with some pretty rigorous cleaning um, and rewaxing to get that life out of a chain. And to put that into context, that is about a 20% improvement on the secret chain blend that they've got um, and the numbers that they quote for that uh, formulation. But then again, when you consider how many recoatings you would have to do with that wax, it's actually probably more economical to just buy a new chain. Um, so yeah, we'll leave that one to you guys to, to have a think about. The key thing is though, I think that's worth remembering is that this product is most certainly for the very, very few. So Simon, this brand new disc wheel, which is the widest one ever made, well, it sounds quite intriguing. Tell us more about it. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. The Parkour Disc 2 is optimized around a 28 millimeter tire and it's the first disc to be that wide. Parkour have said that even in their testing with a 30 millimeter tire, even the 30 has shown no measurable aero penalty. And actually, Dov Tate said to me, the founder of Parkour this is, he said that the 30 actually tested very slightly faster. But because it was within the margin for error, then they're saying no measurable penalty, but it was actually a bit faster. And of course, with the 30, the rolling resistance is better. So he said, um, if you can run a 30, then you would do. There would be no reason not to. Of course, so if you run a 30, Obviously, you've got that kind of rolling resistance gain, but surely there's other gains in the forms of slightly lower pressure, uh, more comfort and more grip, right? Yeah, exactly. You can lo you, with lower pressure, it goes faster because, you know, it rolls over the bumps better. You, you reduce the hysteresis loss. But all that really made me start thinking, you know, so how wide are wheels and tyres going to go for road bikes? You know, have we reached peak wideness? So I actually went and spoke to Dov Tate. I went to his headquarters in Putnam in the Surrey Hills and had a good chat with him. He said, basically, it's 
it mostly depends on the, the roughness of the road for road wheels anyway. Um, so as long as the tarmac doesn't really get any rougher, then 28 is probably sort of approaching a kind of sweet spot for road wheels. What does that then mean for internal rim widths? What's the sweet spot there? Yeah, so the disc has got an internal rim width of 22.5 millimetres, which means that the tyre is going to be pretty flush with the, the, the wall of the disc, or, or rather the surface of the disc. So Dov said to me that really there's no point in road tyres being any wider than sort of say 30 millimetres, as long as tarmac doesn't get any rougher. Um, because you, you don't really need, like, like a gravel tyre is huge to absorb big bumps, um, you, you're not really going to get that on the road. It just goes to show you that it really is all about the surface that the tyre is going to have to be going over. But if the wheels uh, were um, wider, um, are there any tyres that would be suitable to be used? <laughs> I mean, that, that is a good point, actually. And Dov did say that uh, the wheel manufacturers, wheel designers, are driven by tyre development. And if you haven't got a fast, lightweight road tyre that's wider than 32, there is a, a, a GP5000 STR which is 32, that's the widest one, but the Vittoria Corsa is still 28 millimetres in the tubeless, that's the widest one. So why, why would you design a wheel that's really wide if there's no suitable tyres? You're not going to put a sort of slow heavy gravel tyre on a really fast aero road wheel. Yeah, what about um, the sort of aerodynamic benefits? And that gets them trotted out quite a bit. You've got that flush sort of uh, yeah. join between the um, tyre and, um, yeah, and the hookless rims. Um, yeah, is, is there not a discernible difference there? Well, he, he said to me actually that um, he'd never seen a test where a wheel manufacturer had tested an identical rim, hookless and hooked. Um, whereas he actually has done that with the Strada wheel and he tested them side by side, the hookless and the hooked on an identical rim and there was no difference at all. That's so, I mean, one other innovation that we've seen in the world of wheels are carbon spokes. And obviously they're something that we see on kind of very high-end wheels, especially the Kdex wheels. Yeah. But did Dov have a take on those? Yeah, he did. And he actually had a wheel that was made with carbon spokes that he showed me. Yeah. Um, he said, you know, anybody can make a wheel with carbon spokes because you just buy them from the same factory as everybody else. But the one that he showed me was on a, it, it was with a normal hub and a, and a normal rim. but. The carbon spokes had steel inserts on either end so that, uh, so that they could fit into the spoke hole because otherwise carbon spokes are sort of too fat yeah. and to go into a normal hub or and a normal rim and you have to have custom hubs made. They do save a bit of weight. Um, he said sort of 100 grams per wheel, but they cost a lot more. So it's like $5 per spoke compared to kind of $1.50 uh, for the Sapim CX rays that they've been using. So it, it's quite a lot more money for, for a saving of 100 grams. Carbon is great um, in tension, but, um, but it can snap easily, and if it snaps, you're left with carbon shards, um, which is not really very nice. Steel really is, is a lot more predictable. It, it, uh, if you want to cut steel, then you, you, you cut it, you, you bend it, and it, and it yeah. goes. I mean, OK, it fatigues, but um, it, it's, a, it's a better material for spokes. So that's parkour and the parkour disc two. And if you want to read my whole feature um, from my chat with Dov Tate, then it's in the link in the description. For this month's Garmin giveaway, we're going to be giving away a Garmin Varia RCT715. Now, we've given away quite a few of these, but just to recap on all the benefits it has to offer, it has a 1080p camera and it shoots at 30 frames a second, so you'll be sure to capture any close passes and reg plates while you're out on the road. It'll also be absolutely fine in the rain because it can be submerged up to a metre for 30 minutes, so a bit of rain and it will be absolutely fine. It, of of course has the automatic incident capture which ensures that it will continue recording before, during and after an accident so you'll be sure to capture all that information. It can also be controlled via the Varia app so you can retrieve your footage from there and you can even transfer it to computer if you would like to. And of course this is all alongside the benefits of having a radar on your bike so you'll be able to see when cyclists or um, other road users are coming up behind you. If you'd like to be in with a chance of winning a Varia then just head to to the link in the description and get yourself entered. So Stefan, we have seen the release of the brand new Tax Neo Plus smart bike and with that release we saw a pretty hefty jump in the price of it to now match the Wahoo Kicker bike. So they're now very much head-to-head -head rivals. How do they compare? Yeah, it's quite interesting. Both brands are updating their bikes um, so so close to each other, and especially the yeah, as you say, these changes in price as well. Um, now they're both on an equal footing. The uh, Wahoo Kicker bike has yeah, gone up by yeah, a couple of hundred, but um, yeah, it's the tax fat has really leapt up in price, and so I thought it'd be quite interesting to go through uh, what's changed with these bikes. And yeah, spoiler, um, not much. And Cycling Weekly has had both of the bikes in, and so I thought it'd be quite interesting to run through. Uh, yeah, have a two stack up, which is looking the most powerful uh, or the best uh, smart bike. Uh, out of the two right now.
with the release of that new tax then and the huge price jump, what has what's changed? I think the biggest one for me is the fact that you now have the option of five different crank lengths. Um, before you only had three and it was um, yeah, 170, 172.5 and 175. But now you can go all the way down to 165 millimeters. And so, well, matching where the um, Wahoo kicker bike was before. But yeah, it is a good uh, step forward, I think, uh, for um, yeah, the tax platform. And yeah, in terms of the um, other changes, the um, seat post is now a little bit slimmer. And uh, that's uh, an issue that um, I found um, yeah, myself uh, riding the previous uh, version about uh, the chunky seat post. So I kind of hit the back of my thigh a little bit in yeah, certain positions on the bike, um, but that has been slimmed down now. There's more adjustability in the numbers uh, yeah, on the um, seat post and um, yeah, on the, where the head tube, I suppose, would be. The increments are much finer, and so making those yeah, minimal adjustments is yeah, a little bit more accurate as well. And uh, finally, it's um, the uh, shifters. You can now sort of program them. So they uh, shift in the way that different uh, group set brands uh, yeah. shift, and you can now have your tax bike yeah, mimicking that uh, exactly. Okay, but that doesn't really feel like over a thousand pounds worth of changes. No, <laughs> I have to say, yeah, with the price increase, it has got to be really matching the Wahoo kicker bike. And so tax with prestige that the brand um, has, I'm um, thinking that, uh, yeah, the Wahoo bike, the two of them should maybe be on the um, same playing field. And so, um, yeah, and competing in the exactly the same market. And so I think uh, that's really um, what's behind the price increase. But um, yeah, a thousand pounds, a thousand dollars. Yeah, it is something else. There's something going on there. I think. Okay. And then, but that's the thing. The kicker bike was updated fairly recently and that too saw new features and it does mean that actually the tax doesn't match the Wahoo kicker bike like for like, punch for punch, because we saw Wi-Fi connectivity, we saw a direct connect feature um, on the Wahoo kicker bike, you've got a tilt system on the Wahoo kicker bike, which wasn't new, but it, it's a pretty um, significant feature to have on a smart bike, and then you've also got the ERG easy ramp mode to get going nice and easily, so um, it feels like there's still actually quite a big difference in what the two units offer. Yeah, but it's true that, um, yeah, in terms of the core sort of stats, the, um, yeah, the power and the inclines, uh, everything is kind of other muchness. Um, the accuracy for both is plus or minus 1%. Uh, the tax goes up to 25% inclines, whereas the kicker only does 20 But, yeah, in reality, um, you're not going yeah. to be missing that uh, 5%. And, yeah, and when it comes to the uh, maximum resistance that can be offered, the Wahoo bike is yeah, now at 2,500, so 300 watt increase. Uh, the tax is still at 2,200. So in terms of the core stats for the smart bike and the yeah, other muchness, it's those uh, finer details. Um, where you see a little bit of a divergence and I think uh, yeah, a really significant one is is that uh, Wi-Fi connectivity and yes. the, uh, being able to sort of plug it in directly um, to your computer. But I think that is a real uh, step up. I mean, the tax does have its fans, but uh, to be honest, those fans are not super powerful. I prefer an actual floor fan, yes. like a 20-inch thing. Like You get a lot more air moving from that. And so uh, that's something that the tax has, but I don't think that's a relevant um, point so much. It's got the little tray, uh, which is yeah, super useful. And, um, and it's uh, well, it doesn't have a top tube at all whereas the, uh, uh, the Wahoo bike uh, does have a pretty boxy uh, top tube and as I say I've not ridden it myself but uh, people that I've spoken to tend to hit their knees a little bit on that um, top tube so if um, you tr tend to track inward a little bit um, which I do myself ergonomics might just be like a fundamental uh, sort of barrier to um, uh, you using it but as you say the uh, taxes move forwards but it seems that the, uh, yeah, the Wahoo kicker bike is moving forward also move yeah, forwards exactly. as well. and at the yeah. same price now there's not that yeah, difference in price whereas the um, tax before was always that little bit cheaper. So as you say it's potentially going to come down to ergonomics and what suits different riders better. Personally, I think the Tax Neo bike looks better, purely from an aesthetics point of view compared to the Wahoo. But if that's at the cost of ergonomics, then you're probably not really going to want to use it. So potentially, I mean, for you, out of the two, which one would you go for? I have to say it would be the Tax, because yeah. yeah, as you say, so like fundamentally, like if you can't ride a thing properly, then that's yeah, just not going to work at all. But um, if, if we held all that equal and said that um, the top tube on the Wahoo was fine, I'd be going for the, uh, yeah, the better connectivity, the yes. yeah, more responsive. Um, yeah, it would, yeah, it just seems like a better solution, really. Absolutely. Simon, yeah, I mean, two, I was, which would you I was, go I was, for? Well, <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too fond of the look of the, the Wahoo bike actually yeah. but I think I would probably go with the the, uh, the tax <laughs> yeah I know it's only going to be me looking at it but you know I'm the one who's got to live with it absolutely yeah. do you think either bike is really worth the money though the, yeah the three thousand power or nearly four four thousand dollar spend well I mean I've got to declare here that I'm a watt bike owner and I, I bought I bought the watt bike with my own money and I bought it over a year ago and I'm really happy with it and it was a hell of a lot cheaper than both of those bikes you know the ergonomics are really good with a watt bike it only has a one fixed crank length which is um, probably okay. where it's it's at a little bit of a disadvantage compared to those and I think for a lot of people being able to save 
save that amount of money, I think those are potentially compromises that uh, a lot of us would be willing to make, especially when you're talking about a four-figure saving. Um, But I think this leads us on to a kind of a wider conversation of smart bikes versus turbo trainers. I know where I stand on this. I'm very much a smart trainer kind of person. I'm guessing since you put, you know, nearly 2,000 pounds into a smart bike, you must be team smart bike, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it really is one of the best things I've ever bought. Seriously. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Stefan, yeah. how about you? What, how do you see it? What would you prefer to be on? Uh, well, when it comes to what I prefer to ride, it's it's a smart bike. Um, like it's wow. so it's so stable. But I think that uh, when it, when it comes to you, your own money, really, the, you can get really really good turbo trainers for yeah not not so much uh, these days. And um, if you manage to stack up a good offer, which uh, there's quite a few of them at this um, uh, time of year, um, you can get them for about um, yeah half a grand. And when when you compare that to um, yeah where the um, tax and the um, Wahoo bikes are now, um, for me um, the investment it's just, it's just not really sort of like worth that a step up in price. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think to some extent I've got to agree with you. I love the stability and the ride feel of a smart bike, which, you know, are unparalleled compared to a smart trainer. But maybe maybe it's because I live in a flat. I like the ability to be able to pack something away and not have to have it in my living room all of the time. Um, And yeah, the entry point is just that much cheaper. I'd be really interested to hear what all your thoughts are. Would you go smart bike? or do you prefer the smart trainer? I've got a gut instinct on what the vote's gonna come out here like. I'll put a poll up as well um, so we can get as many people involved as possible. But um, yeah, let us know your thoughts down in the comments. Smart bike or smart trainer? Our bike of the month for December is this. This is the Cannondale CAD Optimo 1. And I think there's a lot to like about this bike. First up, very obviously, I'm actually a really big fan of kind of the subtle, kind of classy look of the bike. It's it's nice and simple, but I think that should mean it's pretty timeless. But this bike actually, it retails at £1,300 here in the UK, but at the moment can be found in the sales for sub £1,000. So I think this is a bit of a steal in terms of what you're getting. You're getting a really nice high quality aluminium frame, you're getting 105 shifting components, and it's all put together really nicely. I will say though, there are a couple of things that I would say let the bike down. Those being the brake calipers, they are kind of just pretty standard Tektro um, dual pivot calipers. So not the worst, but it would have been nice if it was 105 or even just some generic Shimano. Um, the other thing as well I'd say is actually the chain set. Um, you do often find this FSA Gossamer chain set on a lot of bikes around this price point, um, but you will be sacrificing slightly on shifting because of it. And then of course, with any bike, the wheels, they would definitely be the first things that I would change. But I think at this price point, I think it does represent quite good value, especially when you consider the quality of the frame. Yeah, we don't see many rim brake um, bikes these days, but um, for yeah, this um, yeah, lower end sort of price scale, I think they, they make a whole lot of sense. And really, the, uh, the weight of these um, sort of mechanical um, yeah, disc brake bikes is yeah, it's quite substantial. But um, yeah, you save a fair bit um, with the rim brakes, and so yeah, I, I think that does help things out um, yeah, quite a bit there. And it's also quite nice the internal cable routing that um, they have. It's um, the, way, the way that it comes out um, yeah, down the bottom and um, by the bottom bracket. Um, yeah. yeah, you literally just um, yeah, feed the cable through, yes. and it comes out um, the other side. And so, yeah, it's quite neat, I think, and the that sort of maintenance aspect of the bike as well. Exactly, yeah, because where they are kind of rooted through that down tube, it does mean that they're going to be protected from the elements, um, but it also means that servicing and recabling is a much easier job than it would be, say, on a fully internally rooted bike, which I think is quite nice, and it suits what this bike is designed to do. We've also got hidden mudguard and rack mounts. So if you wanted to use it for commuting or longer days in the saddle, it works for that. It is also slightly more aggressive than a specialized alley. So if you wanted to use it on a crit and chuck in some deep section carbon wheels, then you could do that and, and race it without really worrying about the bike too much. I think that's, that's quite a good option. Do we know how much it weighs? So impressively, the bike comes in at a smidge over nine kilos. Wow. Which is pretty impressive when you consider that there's much more expensive bikes on the market with electronic gears and hydraulic brakes um, that come in weighing a lot more. Yeah, I mean, that's part of the reason why they do weigh more, I think. <laughs> exactly that, yeah, no, that's very true. So actually the simplicity of this bike is, uh, yeah, definitely helps because yeah, in the weight department, it's very much comparable with the best. But yeah, like I say, I just think this represents quite a lot of value and for people wanting to get into cycling and wanting something that will see them through many years of cycling, 
I think this is a great example because this really lends itself to upgrades and those upgrades would mean that it has years and years of life left in it. So there we have it. That is the final tech of the month of 2022. We'll of course be back in January, but in the meantime, we hope you all enjoy a fantastic festive season. If you enjoyed the video, drop it a like, subscribe to the channel for more content, and we'll see you again very soon.